BMW's R1100S, when first introduced, did not have the American owner's manual. So that put us on hold for a bit for selling these machines until the manual was available. And then they were popular. We had lots of people coming in for test rides, and I'll tell you about the hairiest of them all. Gentleman comes in looking for an R1100S. He tells me he's been a 10-year dirt bike veteran, but he's been out of the saddle for quite a while, and he wants to get back into riding, but he wants to ride on the street. I'm going to take him for a test ride. That means I'm riding my machine, and I'm going to put this gentleman on the demo. We leave the parking lot, and we have to make an immediate ride out of the parking lot onto the street, which brings us immediately to an intersection where you have to go left or right. We're going to go left, so we're crossing traffic. Um, we go at an appropriate time, and he almost doesn't make that left-hand turn. He's, he's bouncing along the granite curbing on the right side of the road. I stop and I'm like, are you okay? He's like, well, uh, yeah, I'm just not, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll be okay. So I'm going to make this test ride short and I'll wrap this up quick. We don't go too far. Uh, we make it back successfully. And this guy's really not so confident on this bike. And I figure there's no way he's going to buy this bike. A week later, he comes in, and he is now the proud owner of a brand new R1100S. A week or so later, like I have it back on my lift, and the customers put the 600 miles on it. And it's ready for its first service. The first service is, like the rest of the oil heads, consists of draining your engine oil, changing your filter. You do these while the drivetrain is hot. Draining the rear drive and replenishing the 230 cc's of gear lube, GL5 gear lube. The transmission does not need any attention at this service since, as I said in an earlier episode, GearTrag was now flushing these transmissions with gear oil after they were assembled. So they no longer needed that first oil change interval so soon at 600 miles. Along with these fluids being changed, there are a bunch of things to check. And of course, the valves are going to be readjusted, which uh, in this particular service and only this service, the 600-mile service, is the only time other than head disassembly, reassembly, that you will retorque the cylinder head studs. This process at the 600 mile service involves loosening one of the four cylinder head stud nuts, retorquing it to 20 newton meters, and then turning it 180 degrees with your degree wheel. Basically turning the nut another half a turn. Angle torquing. A lot of things are done with angle torque. After those four are done, there's a, an M10 bolt that you're going to hit that's 40 newton meters. So that would be loosened and then torqued to 40. And that takes care of that cylinder retorquing. You would then adjust the valves, move on over to the other side, retorque that cylinder head, and adjust those valves, clean up the valve cover gasket mating surfaces, Put a little bit of oil on that little gasket in the middle of the valve cover and put your covers back on. Then, because we're at the BMW dealership and we have to use their diagnostic computer, the Modi Tech, you have to hook it up to the Modi Tech, read out any of the fault codes and all of that happiness. And then we're going to use the Modi Tech and synchronize the throttle bodies. And the funny thing about the Modi Tech is it recognizes the right cylinder of the oil heads as cylinder number one. And that is incorrect. 
Cylinder number one is on the left as you are seated on the machine, not on the right. It's on the left. It's the cylinder most forward on the engine case. Always number one. He who art up front holds the number one position, eh? So, Moditech's all confused. It sees cylinder number two is number one, and that's okay. We all laughed because it's made in England, so it's, you know, it's on the wrong side of the road and all. Uh, no offense to my wrong side of the road friends and viewers. After you get it all tuned with the Moditech, which doesn't do a whole lot, you know, we can do the same thing with our carb tuner too, our carb mate, our twin max, our tube with our tube with automatic transmission fluid in it. You can do the same thing. You're just balancing the air intake left to right. See we're off, pulling to the left side a little bit. That is corrected with your air screw. First thing you need to check is you need to make sure that there's free play at the cables right here. You have to make sure that there's one millimeter of free play. What you do is you take the bell crank on the bottom, hold it back, and pull on the barrel. You see, you see how the barrel moves? That is good. If it doesn't move, that means the throttle body butterfly is cracked open slightly, which means the pulses of the engine running beat the shit out of the throttle body shaft pushings. And then you have an air leak at the throttle body and the bike will run like shit. The wrench, well, we will eventually. Our idle, we want a base setting. The screws should be one and a quarter turns out. So we go in, one half, one full, one and one half, two, half, one, one half, one and one half. Same the other side. In, one half, one, one and one half, bottomed out, come out the same way. Don't always trust these tachometers. Right now it's idling at 1100 RPM. Seems a little high to me, but anyway, we want to put that dial this in. You're going to do that with these air screws. Backing the left one out is no good. We're going to go in. Now we're bouncing equally from side to side. We're good. Now under load. Ship it. Done. Simple enough. But reading out the fault codes is a, is a different event. And without the Modi Tech, without BMW's diagnostic tools, we would all be screwed were it not for the GS911. This tool is critical to working on these bikes post-2000 model year most of them not so important prior to that but if you've got a 2000 and newer bmw you're really going to need one of these this particular one sitting on my lift right and you have to check everything including tire pressure and his tire pressure is okay because i just sent the bike out the door not even two weeks earlier and uh all the lights work and the horn works and it doesn't have any fault codes and none of that but i look at the rear brake and i look at the odometer again and i think it was 632 and i look at the rear brakes again and i look at the other side of the brake disc and i look at the caliper and i take the caliper off and i scratch my head there's no brake pad material left. This rear disc is scored. This thing is metal to metal. 
The fronts don't have anywhere at all. Looks like they haven't even been used. So I call a customer. Hey, what's going on here? Your rear brakes are smoked. What have you been doing? <laughs> Tells me rear brake's the only brake he uses, just like on the dirt bikes. Hmm. You use both brakes on the dirt and the street all the time. So once I informed him of the proper way to brake, and I gave him a couple of demonstrations when he came and picked the machine up, he didn't have that problem again. Issues with these bikes are few. They can strip the input shaft splines on the transmission to the clutch. That can happen. When BMW decided that these should all have a hydraulic clutch, somebody fucked up. Normally, K bikes, all the 1100 bikes, 850s, etc., your clutch would sit here on the shaft. There would be a little bit of the drive shaft protruding through the clutch. When they went to the hydraulic clutch, they messed up the measurement and it ends up here. What happens is you're not utilizing all of the splined area on either the clutch hub or the shaft. These tend to strip anywhere between 7,000, 24,000. Some have made it over 48,000 and just had distorted splines. Strips out. Even you're sitting on the side of the road, as we see, teeth are gone, except on the end where they never went in the shaft never went into it anyway. This is an additional disc, same issue. So what needs to be done to prevent this is to move this disc all the way back onto the shaft where it's supposed to be. You can achieve that by putting a spacer in and moving this back. You can obtain just such a clutch disc from Beamer Boneyard. This is similar to what Bruno used to make for his modified disc where he'd move the splines back with a spacer. But there's another part you should change as well. Clutch slave cylinder from the oil head in the 1150s. As we can see, there's a little bearing in here in the center clutch rod rides in this. The clutch rod, when you pull the clutch in, spins at the engine RPM. Uh, this bearing, as we can see, has failed. It's very sloppy. What happens when that fails, as this one is done, is the entire piston spins in this bore. When that happens, the seal gets hot, fails, but it scores the inside of the bore. and then you have no clutch lever. Very important to replace these. And from my experience, the ones directly from BMW have been inferior to the ones from Beamer Boneyard, despite the fact that it's the same thing made from Magura. Other issues, you know, nothing abnormal from the rest of the oil head series. You can have you can have a, a haul unit go bad. New haul unit. Feed the electrical lead through. They're susceptible to overheating. So a bike that sees a lot of heavy stop and go traffic use is more likely to have a haul unit failure than a bike that's uh, you know used on yeah, Sundays uh, and keeps moving along at a nice pace. Fit the plate into position. Oh, these nice marks we have. Roughly aligning it with the marks that you scribed in from the previous clip. Oh. Alternator belt, of course, is as, as, as prone to failure as the rest of them. And it's, that's not saying that they're prone to failure. They last a long time. You should replace it at 36,000 miles. I have seen them make it into the 50,000 mile range, but they do break then. They get old. They dry out. It's only so many times that belt can turn around the pulleys. I got no other big, big uh, issues with this bike. Occasionally, the exhaust system breaks, 
And when the exhaust system breaks in the back, it can become a rattler. All of that stuff is weldable. Find a good welder. They can weld that weld whatever whatever part has failed. You can weld it back together. Only had that issue on a couple of S's where the exhaust was falling apart and, and rattling. As far as aftermarket exhausts, I got no comment. They're usually too loud. Let's put it that way. When the service is done, the bike goes out the door and and we won't see it again till 6,000 miles when it will get another valve adjustment without retorque of the cylinder heads. And then we would see the bike again at 12,000 miles for a bit more of an extensive service. And again at 18 for what we did, the same as the 6,000. And at 24,000, it gets an even more extensive service than it did at 12,000. And at any of those services, depending how, how long it's been or what time of year it is, you could add an annual service to it as well, which would consist of brake fluid change and some other items. In the next episode, I'm going to have to talk about the frame. I want to talk about what happens to these bikes when they don't stay on two wheels. Stay tuned, my friends. There'll be more about the R1100S and its frame in the next video. Thank you, my friends. If you've enjoyed this episode, please do me the favor of giving it a thumbs up. That helps. If you're of the means and you'd really like to support my video work, please become a patron over on my Patreon page. That's what funds all of this every month so I can keep going with the video work that we're all enjoying. If you stick around here in this video, in a moment, I'm going to mention a couple other bits about the R1100S regarding brakes and clutch. Servo equipped bikes, Evo brake systems, the one with the electronic power assisted brakes, that miserable brake system is just a miserable failure and never should have made it to anything with two wheels. That's BMW experimenting with us two wheeled idiots before they give it to their four wheeled favorites. That brake system can fail, so you're going to have issues with that. The input shafts blind to the to the clutch. There's people out there that have put a lot of miles on this drivetrain in the S model and others that have not had any spline issues. I'll reiterate that. There are tens of thousands, if not more, of these machines out there that have not stripped the input splines. However, I've seen a lot of them that have. And a lot of them that have are gently ridden by people. And that's some of the problem. There's a, there's, you know, you get a harmonic vibration when running at a low RPM that sometimes isn't good for the rest of the drivetrain. And we already know about the design flaw where when they went to the hydraulic clutch, they moved the damn disc off the end of the shaft. That causes problems. Knowing all of this, you could have one that never had a problem, but you'd always, in my mind, be at risk of suffering from that design flaw. That's why Bruno came up with moving the splines on the clutch hub so that the splines would have full engagement both on the clutch hub and, and on the spline, input shaft splines that they ride on. Bruno's not with us anymore. Rest in peace. But Beamer Boneyard has a solution to that, as seen here. That, in my mind, would 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 help uh, help ease my worries if I were to be on an R1100S long term. And being a cheapskate, I can't afford to be breaking down uh, uh, somewhere else in the country and uh, needing to haul this thing back. So.
Thank you, my friends. You'll see me again soon. Take care.